Over the years, people have traveled to Calvin University and Calvin Theological Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan to worship and learn. This year, we travel virtually around the world to many different worshiping communities. We are living in a time of fear, upheaval, and so much death. Each community has been shaped by the COVID-19 pandemic in different ways. However, we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We cling to this promise, which will guide us for this online experience.
Please join me in the call to worship as it appears on your screen. I invite you to say these words as we join together in community around the world for worship. Let us hear what God the Lord will speak. Surely God's salvation is at hand for those who revere God. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. Let us pray. God of justice and righteousness and grace and mercy. God, for this day, we give you thanks. God, we are grateful for your loving kindness and tender mercy is better than life itself. And now, by virtue of the wisdom you have given humanity and through these technological platforms, God, we are grateful that we can now be assembled for worship. God, we pray that you would breathe on us, that you would take every distraction and encumbrance, impediment, take it out of our way. God, remove it so that we can hear only you. God, that all that is said, that is done, speaks to your people, challenges us, grows us, convicts us, and compels us to do works of justice and mercy in the world. And so God, now have your way so that all that is said and done brings you and you alone glory and honor and praise. It is our confident prayer. We offer it and ourselves with hope, expectancy, and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.
The scripture reading for today comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Listen for the word of the Lord. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Holy word, holy wisdom. Thanks be to God. Oh, here comes Satan, better run and hide. If you're in God's house, you better stay inside. Oh, Satan's here, oh, Satan's there. You can find oh, Satan most anywhere. Don't you know the old devil got loose in the night? Or a little chicken, God, cause the devil got loose in the land. Oh, run on down to the Jordan River. Cover your face with the fiery river. Let your feet on the rock of ages, cause the devil got loose in the land. Oh, you better run, little chicken. Oh, Satan's with us, rain or shine. Don't you know the old devil got loose in the land? So look out, children, better well, fall in love. Don't you know the old devil got loose in the land? Don't fall to the east, don't fall to the west. Don't you know the old devil got loose in the land? Well, in the middle of Jesus' breath. Don't you know the old devil got loose in the land? For a little children. Shout, shout, Satan's apart. Don't you know the old devil got loose in the land? That's the only way you can't keep him up. Don't you know the old devil got loose in the land? Or oh, run to the rock, hide your face. Don't you know the old devil got loose in the land? Or oh, run from the devil, it ain't no disgrace. Don't you know the old devil got loose in the land? Or oh, run, little children.
scripture has been read, I would just like to raise two verses for us to anchor our time together. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Verse 18, pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. For the time that is ours, I want us to consider this text with this title, Run, Fight, Vote, and Pray, because someday is coming. Let us pray. Good and gracious God of love, justice, and mercy, we are grateful for your word and grateful that you speak. And so now, God, it is yours to speak and ours to listen. Let every thought that your servant thinks be yours. When your servant speaks, let the people hear your voice. May your word compel and challenge us to greater works of love and justice. And when we are done with this service and this day, may we be resolved and changed in such a way that you get even greater glory and delight out of our lives. This is our confident prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Run, fight, vote, and pray, because someday is coming. 2016, at the beginning of this administration, Many commentators and pundits remarked that it was the ugliest presidential campaign in American history. Scandals about emails and racism, misogyny, tax evasion, unethical business practices, accusations of untruth on both sides. It was ugly and it was awful. And now at the end of this administration, it's coronavirus and lies. I don't work for the media, I am not employed by them, so I don't have to use euphemisms like having an adversarial relationship with the truth or disproven facts, which is an oxymoron. In 2020, at the end of this administration, it is the coronavirus and a lockdown. Lies about an election lost by millions of votes. Children in cages separated from parents that cannot be located emoluments clauses ignored and eroded, stolen Supreme Court justice seats and the continued assault on the infrastructure of democracy, while sheepish sycophants whose bank accounts grow cannot figure out how to congratulate their next boss because they fear their current boss more than God. And on day 2,429, Flint, Michigan still has no clean water. It's 2020. From a theological standpoint, most if not all of this is ungodly. And it should be noted that there is one huge thing that these last four years have reminded some of us of some things others of us have already known. That in America, racism is still a problem. In America, misogyny is still a problem. In America, black and brown women and men are still not safe. In America, Native Americans and Latinx and Asian American people and queer people are still marginalized. Black lives still don't matter as much as white ones, females as much as males. And so people don't realize how difficult, shallow calls for unity are when you know that people fundamentally do not value who you are as a whole human being, see you as equal, and believe that unity is having you in the room but not in the discussion or the decision. It's 2020. And this non-equal valuing of human life is not a political issue. It is not an ideological issue. It is not a philosophical issue. It is a theological one. It is a theological issue that has, has become perverted in the psychological landscape 
and roots of many in America. Now it is informed by many things, too many for this sermon to address. But this sermon is not about theological anthropology. It's not about politics, politics or presidential campaigns. It is about someday. In her article entitled Ephesians, in True to Our Native Land and African American New Testament Commentary, Dr. Mitzi Smith writes that Ephesians reads like a legal document detailing a corporate merger of two bodies, one foreign, Gentiles, and one domestic, the circumcision, Jews. She writes that this merger results in a united church as one body with Christ as its head. But as we know, sometimes a teacher has to write to the students to remind them of truths they should already know and exhort them again and again and again to live in these principles. The writer is presumed to be someone from the Pauline school, not Paul himself. The writing styles are different, so it raises that question. So the writer is someone we will conveniently call Paul. The text, in the text, there is no particular error or heresy addressed. There is no particular crisis. It is likely written to a mixed audience, and it is written to expand the horizons of the readers so that they may better understand the dimensions of God's eternal purpose and grace, and so that they may come to appreciate the high goals that God has for the church. So it is about expectations of thinking and behavior that the people of God should demonstrate. That is the purpose of this letter. So in the introduction, there is a salutation, there is a blessing. And Paul also gives a report and a thanksgiving about the Ephesians' love toward all the saints. And even with this laudatory comment about who the Ephesians church is, even though there are reports about their love for all the saints, there are still virtues in the Ephesian church in which its members can still grow. There are still places, there are still some growing edges, there's some places where there's some possible um, opportunities for slippage in which this church can fall. There are some places, uh, some areas, um, as we say in the black church, there are some areas where the Ephesians church is prone to backslide. There's some virtues that they need to be reminded of and remember, so they'll the writer writes this letter. And in the body, he reminds them that, that they're saved by grace. It is nothing that they have done. They can't earn it. They are saved by grace, that they are no longer strangers and aliens of God, but they are members of the household of faith. The writer identifies himself as a prisoner for Christ for the Gentiles. And he exhorts them um, to live according to their calling. And then he goes on to explain these household codes, these rules that were set forth for governing relationships between husbands and wives, parents and children, enslaver and enslaved. Dr. Smith writes that the household codes in Ephesians reflect an idealized notion of the hierarchical structure of the Roman household and with early Christianity as a household movement. The hierarchical structure of the Roman household with the early Christianity as a household movement. They prescribe an ideal about how the members of the Christian household ought to conduct their lives in relation to one another. Section 10 is where we find our text for today. And I must confess that this is the first time this text has troubled me. I have always read this text in a particular way, and this was before seminary. I read this text in a particular manner and even after seminary. But this time I read the text and I found it troubling because as I looked at the text and where this pericope is in relationship to the rest of the text, it occurred to me why after these exhortations about how to live and how to be in relationship and that they are one in God and that they are exhorted for their love of the saints, that they've seemed to master some virtues and have a little growing edge on the other. Why after all of this with no clear heresy, no clear error, no crisis described, why now would the writer put in this militaristic exhortation to gear up like they're going to war? 
interesting that this text comes right behind, it follows rather, the text on the enslaved and the enslavers, problematic text. I will leave that to the New Testament scholars. But we find this text about putting on armor and being ready for warfare. It's odd, and I'm still scratching my head about it. But my mind goes back to Dr. Smith's explanation about household codes. She writes that they reflect an idealized notion of a hierarchical structure of the Roman household with the early Christian with early Christianity as a household movement. There are a couple of problematics in this text. An idealized notion of the hierarchical structure. My question is, ideal according to whom? Because depending on who defines ideal, it is less than ideal for somebody else. So there's a problematic even in this idealized notion. Already I'm beginning to be suspicious about these household codes. But again, I'm going to leave that to the New Testament scholars. So I'm wrestling, why is this war language here? Why is this fight language here? Why do the saints have to gear up after they've been exhorted for their love? And she also mentions this theological justification for ideal conduct. Whenever theological justification is used, that usually makes my raises my dander. It usually makes me uncomfortable because as an African-American woman in this country, I know the theological justifications that have been used to oppress and enslave and brutalize and torture people of color, black people, Asian people, Latinx people, queer people. The Bible is used as a tool. I'm clear. It makes me nervous. Why do the saints have to go to war? What I hear in the text is a shift and perhaps, and this is all my sanctified imagination, what I hear in the text is perhaps this writer trying to reconcile empire and the gospel. What I hear in the text is a writer trying to blend Rome and Christianity in a way that maintains the status quo. What I hear in the text is a writer who knows that when you get two people from opposite ends of the spectrum, from two different cultural backgrounds, from two different ethnic backgrounds, that the merger is not always going to be smooth and easy. What I hear in the text is a writer who recognizes that the human impulse and the human instinct is sometimes to be selfish, is sometimes to be greedy, is sometimes to want what they want when they want it, how they want it, that the human impulse is to be entitled. What I hear in the text is a writer who recognizes he's got two groups of people who do not necessarily see eye to eye. I'm not talking about the states, I'm talking about the Bible. Empire and the church. And it makes me think, makes me ask, is war really required for us to be one? Does unity have to come as the result of a fight? It is not mine to answer, and it is far beyond the scope of this sermon, but these are questions. But this writer is trying to reconcile. And so here we have this exhortation. And he is clear or explicit to identify for the church at Ephesus, the struggle. He wants to be clear about who the opponents are. What is the object of the struggle? He, 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 he writes in verse 12, he said, our, our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces in heavenly places. 
I do not think the writer is writing to say that people who are before us, colleagues, politicians, friends, family, church members, fill in your own blank. I don't think he is writing to suggest that we don't have real flesh and blood enemies, but rather that there is something that is at work beyond what and who we see in front of us. It is not just blood and flesh against whom we rest. He, he wants the church at Ephesus and us to understand that while we have work, I'm going to use old black church language, while we have work in the earth realm, we also need to understand that we've got work in the spirit realm as well. We can't pray and ask God to fix things that we also have to be engaged in the struggle, in the fight, not only in the earth realm, but in the spirit realm as well. It is not against enemies of flesh and blood, but against rulers against authorities, against cosmic powers in this present darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's old King James language, forgive me, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. We have all heard these parenthetical descriptions as different. I have heard them as 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 different descriptions for the same entity. But, but I'm wondering now if this writer is not trying to describe four different things. Again, it's beyond the scope of this sermon, but he is writing to let us know minimally that we struggle in the earth realm and the spirit realm. And he says, here's what you need to get dressed. It's a battle. You got a belt for your waist, the belt of truth. You've got a breastplate of righteousness. Protect your chest, your heart. What is interesting is that the writer does not have an object for your feet, but writes whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. And I think there's something to that, right? Because you have to gird your loins, as old King James language would say, we would say in the old church, right? You've got something for your waist. You've got something for your heart. But recognizing that the gospel is something to be spread and that justice is a fight that is happening everywhere. We're fighting for justice in all corners of the globe. He says, whatever makes you ready to proclaim the gospel, what I need on my feet in Atlanta might not be what you need on your feet in Michigan. What you need on your feet in Michigan might not be what you need on your feet in California. What the writer is saying is that we need to be ready to proclaim and switch and pivot wherever we are. Whatever you need, whatever gear you need, you know, just make sure whatever it is, it needs to make you ready to proclaim the gospel. Shield of faith, very defined object, Helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit. This armor that we need. Because now what is interesting about this piece about the feet being in the middle of these static objects says that it is a gospel that needs to be carried. It is a gospel that needs to be heard. It is a gospel that needs to be proclaimed, not just where we are, but wherever we go and to wherever we are called. Then the writer says, and pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. Okay. And to that end of praying in the spirit at all times, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for the saints. I read that too quickly all my life, and it wasn't until this sermon. Persevere in supplication for all the saints. Why is this verse here in an exhortation about battle? Because in battle, I have to remember after gearing up for the fight, the writer reminds us to pray because we might be battling and we're not battling alone. We've got to pray that the saints in California are strengthened. We've got to pray that the saints in Mississippi are strengthened. We've got to pray that the saints in Massachusetts are, are strengthened. We have got to pray for those who are not with us and persevere because the fight for justice is wearisome and we get tired. 
And when we get tired, when I sit down, there needs to be somebody that's ready to take my baton and keep it moving until I get my energy replenished and I can stand up and take the baton from somebody behind me who now needs to take their rest. We need to persevere for the saints because the fight for justice continues until everybody is free, until everybody gets access, until everybody is a recipient of justice. And so we pray. Persevering always in supplication for all the saints. Now the ancestors didn't have any fancy armor that this writer is writing about. Enslavers made sure that our ancestors had enough to serve them well, but barely take care of ourselves. But we just heard how Johnson's spiritual run a little chilling, tell us where to hide, what to put on, and where to stand. So run on down to the Jordan River, cover your face with the fiery pillar, pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. Plant your feet on the rock of ages, cause the devil done loose in the land. Run on down to the Jordan River. We still have to run. We've got to run to the voting booths. We've got to run to the office. We've got to run in ways that will make government change. We've still got to fight for justice and equality for African Americans, for Latinx, for women, for Asian Americans, for Native Americans, for queer people, for children, for people who are differently able. We still have to vote. Our ancestors paid for our vote with their very lives. We've got to vote until policies are equitable. We've got to vote until change comes. We've got to vote until the rulers who are trying to rule in high places are unemployed and replaced with somebody who will rule with justice. And we've got to pray without ceasing, always persevering, because someday, someday, Someday is coming. Run, fight, vote, and pray. Because someday is coming. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved of God, join me in prayer. God, we are so grateful for your word, for your challenge, for the hope of your word. We are grateful. And now, God, we pray, God, for your church. God, we pray for your church. God, we ask that you would breathe on her burn away her dross. God, we pray that you would strengthen your church in every good work. God, we pray that you would remove from your church anything that doesn't bring you glory. And God, we pray that you would help your church to be what you want your church to be in the world, a church that reflects your love that works for your justice, that speaks out against evil, that stands for what is true, that is unwavering in her commitment to the truth. God, we pray for your church and thank you for the good work that your church is doing, for the good works of justice and love and mercy and sustaining God, for people who are fed and clothed and housed, God, we thank you. But God, we lift up your church because your church can do and be so much more. God, for your world, this world that you created that continues to be ravaged by a virus. God, we pray for the souls who have been lost 
We pray for their families. God, we pray that you would be what they need you to be. Seats that are empty, hearts that are broken, tears that are falling. God, we pray for those whose families have been touched by COVID. And God, not only those who are grieving the loss of loved ones by COVID, God, for all who grieve, who have lost loved ones, God, a fresh or in anniversary remembrance, the grief that washes up. God, we pray that you would be what they need you to be. Bottle their tears, as your word has said. Cradle their hearts. Rock them in your bosom. Make your nearness known to them. God, for any human being who is living in any kind of lack of food, of clean water, healthy food, shelter, shoes, medicine, God, where there is lack in the world, send someone to be the prayer and the answer. God, there's enough. We know there's enough. Convict those who have abundance, God, to share because we know there is enough. God, for places that are war-torn, for places in drought and famine, God, we pray for your peace. We pray for your shalom. We pray for your spirit to move in the hearts of people, of your people, to bring what is needed that your kingdom will reign on earth. God, for healthcare workers, people on the front lines, for grocery store workers, God, for people who harvest and manufacture and bring us our food, God, for people who make sure there is water and light and energy. God, for people we don't see. They're not invisible because we don't see them. God, you see them. You know them. And they have kept us in these grueling nine months. God, we pray that you would bless and strengthen them and grant them what they need. God, we pray for every hardened, evil, depraved heart that cares nothing about anything or anyone but themselves. God, we pray for them. God, we pray that you would continue to show them signs that they might repent. God, we pray that you will continue to walk up and down every hall of government around the world and where there is injustice. God, we pray that you would convict every heart. Let their sleep be restless until they get it right. God, we pray that you would move. We pray that you would move. We pray that you would move. And God, for needs in our local communities, we call them in our minds and in our hearts. We know you hear us. Meet needs, heal wounds, mend hearts. Bring peace, bring wholeness, bring shalom. God, for the unspoken requests of our hearts, we lift them to you. And we offer this prayer and ourselves to you, confident that you are already answering. 
And we offer it in the strong, matchless, and wonderful name of your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, as one God now and forever. Amen. Hello, I'm Dr. UZ Brown, Chair of the Division of Creative and Performing Arts at Morehouse College. We Shall Overcome is arguably one of the most well-known freedom songs of all time. I was honored to be asked to write an SATV setting of this hopeful song for a performance by the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra with a chorus made up of the Ebenezer Baptist Church Choir and the Morehouse and Spelman College Glee Clubs for National Public Radio's 1999 international broadcast celebrating the 70th birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I wrote an adaptation of We Shall Overcome that is juxtaposed with an old spiritual, I Ain't Got Weary Yet, which is the first melody that you hear at the very beginning of the piece. We Shall Overcome gradually grows out of this evocative melody because though we are not at the beginning of our journey toward freedom, we are indeed still on the journey. We shall overcome. We are not afraid and we'll walk hand in hand, point to our faith for a brighter yet unrealized future. And yet we march on because as the words of this powerful parallel spiritual state, I ain't got weary yet. I've been on this journey a mighty long time and I ain't got weary yet. So indeed, even as the late president Lyndon Baines Johnson was moved to say, we shall overcome.
May the God of our weary years and the God of our silent tears strengthen us to put on our armor and plant our feet to run, fight, vote, and pray until Sunday comes. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, God bless you this day.